thank you, John, and thank you everyone for having me again. Um, maybe we'll just load that presentation up. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing alpha workshops at the moment, so I've got to shoot straight after this and get down to uh, Moema via Shepparton. So um, I'll just have to uh, fly through this, take up questions if there are some, and, and go. But um, my, uh, my presentation is on uh, treatment and control of BRD, bovine respiratory disease in uh, Australian feedlots, and the feedlots that we go and service. And then, I, uh, whether it was courage or whether it was a little bit of folly here, I've got my first picture I presented a uh, sick Hereford amongst a bunch of Brahmins here at a feedlot we uh, go to in, in Queensland and something. But I guess the, the theme of this talk was about uh, respiratory disease in feedlots and, and the uh, and, and Hereford's uh, uh, representation amongst all that disease. And just having a look at the disease itself, this is some American data here, and it just shows over time, this is through the, the uh, 90s, that uh, as a disease process, BRD is, is, uh, and its uh, mortality uh, from it is, is steadily rising over time. And this, if you uh, bring this out to 2013, that trend line would just keep coming up here. And the total death loss being driven by BRD. These other uh, causes of death here just staying fairly flat. BRD is a pretty simple, uh, it's got some complexity, but it's a pretty simple equation. You add some stress to cattle coming into the feedlots add some viral infection, and these viral infections are on the cattle themselves, they're not actually um, uh, resident at the feedlot. It's like, like a, the analogy is kids going to kindergarten, after the first week they come home with a snotty nose. It's the same thing with uh, cattle going into feed yards, and the bacteria involved in the respiratory disease is actually in the back of their nose and throat. So what happens is their, immune, their immunity uh, drops off when they, um, through all the sort of uh, men the marketing uh, practices and otherwise getting into the feed yard, once their immunity drops, the, the resident viruses and bacteria in their own respiratory systems take over and cause respiratory disease. The economic loss is significant. It's the largest economic loss in, in feed yards due to infectious disease. And it accounts for some numbers here at MLA we're looking at, you know, up to $20 per head. In a small margin business, as um, you know, Matt Monk would, would know all too well, this, 40, this $20 per head is, uh, you could, you know, that, that is a big impact. What does it look like? These are cattle affected with respiratory disease in the feed yard. Um, uh, and if we're on post-mortem, when we have a look at the, the, the lungs here, the disease sort of starting from the bottom, heading all the way up. There's a very little amount of lung left with this, and then this is a sort of bad pleurisy. Uh, the cattle are sort of, um, th these are in a couple of hospital pens here. Um, it's, uh, I've got some data here on um, the, the effect of the, the actual rep, the, I guess the proportion of BRD in all the feed yards, a lot of the, oh, excuse me, a lot of the uh, uh, data that we look at, there's um, the occupancy of all the feed yards that we service along with Matt George is just under 370,000 for this period here, the first quarter of uh, this year. The biggest feed lot we go to is 45,000 head and the smallest about 2,800. 2, um, when we look at BRD, in this first quarter here, the, the proportion of uh, all morbidity, all pulls from out of, uh, out of home pens due to BRD is just under 60%. We've got some feet, um, feet morbidity and also bullers. I just had a, added these this morning. When we looked at the next quarter, April to the end of June, you can see that autumn effect here that <coughs> the proportion of all pulls due to BRD has actually risen. Actually now it accounts for 70%, just over 70% of all the reasons that we pull cattle out of pens and treat them. Uh, death loss, first quarter being dominated by BRD is about just uh, 40%. But in the quarter just gone, the, the involving autumn, that uh, death loss has increased up to 55%. So all 55% of all deads is due to, due to BRD. That second quarter was uh, just under 400,000 head of cattle. And uh, again, biggest feed yard at 47,000 head. And um, the thing about BRD and about immunity in cattle, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. There's a picture here is of a of heifer for a caesarean. Now, I've done caesars on, on heifers on rainy, stormy nights. Um, I've, I've had them, them lie down in the dirt and the mud and the, you know, the guts and with, with their abdomen still open. Um, calves that we've pulled out that have been in, in sort of rotten fetal membranes and they've dropped into the abdomen and stuff like that. And you would think with all of that, that um, you know, cattle, yeah, these heifers would get crook. And it's amazing how many of them get through that operation. And get and, and go and you know and fight on happily and have a good lactation and rear a good calf, and yet, you know they've um, they've had all of that happen to them, and uh, yet respiratory disease is so so um, it takes takes hold so quickly in a feed yard setting sort of thing like and it's sort of it's a bit of a, intuitively it just doesn't seem to be the case that this surely would have been more stress and would have been more um, risk of disease, 
when you look at respiratory disease, um, there's a couple of things that have gone on, and uh, in, it's taken us about over 100 years, but in all the selecting for greater digestive capacity, muscle mass frames and, and um, big bulk uh, on, on, these, um, on cattle and what's, uh, what's gone by the wayside, and well, I guess if you think of it fairly crudely, is this big digestive capacity and these big rumens and this big sort of engine has, in very crude terms, has pushed the respiratory system and the, and the chest into a smaller box. So much so that today, bovine lungs have about 25% of the lung volume per unit body weight compared to the mammalian mean. So all mammals, cattle uh, are pretty poor in this area. Have a look at it in, in uh, I guess, in um, sort of physiological terms. The lung volume of, a, of uh, cattle generally, uh, can, you, can you hear me all right if I'm away from there? Yeah. Right, very good. Cattle generally only 12 and a half uh, litres of, uh, of lung volume compared to say a horse with 42 litres there. They're, um, don't worry about the rest of these numbers, but just here's all the mam mammals represented here. The pulmonary flow rate, what's required in cattle just to sort of maintain themselves is, is, as a ratio is, is vastly different compared to the rest of the mammals here. They require this much air being sort of blown through to sort of get by. If you look at that compared to horses, the oxygen consumption in, uh, in mils per minute of a cow versus a horse is vastly different. There's, like, there's almost uh, 10 times the amount of um, re requirements there for a cow and the, the difference here of 250% for them just to maintain themselves. That's the oxygen requirement just to get up and get about. And, uh, and pretty much this has all come about because we've, done, uh, we, we've selected for all of this uh, sort of productive capacity at the expense of the respiratory system. So it doesn't take much for when uh, you put cattle through some, um, some of those stress factors and that's time off feeding water, that's mixing with other cattle um, in the feed yard, uh, all of those sort of stress factors the, the, the only chink in their armour, uh, in, in their immunity, in their, is their respiratory system because physiologically it's actually quite weak compared to all the other animals in, in, uh, in the animal kingdom. The, the viruses that are, um, that are represented in the respiratory disease complex, pretty, ones that are um, pretty, uh, pretty common to cattle, uh, th this one here, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, is a herpes, herpes virus. What these do is once they, uh, it's like, again, it's a kindergarten example, so once they all get mixed together in the feed yard, it doesn't take long for them to pass these just uh, natural cattle viruses around to each other, but that lowers the respiratory system defences. And as these viruses get lower down into the respiratory system and down here right down to the little air sacs, actually damage these air sacs and keep them inflamed, such that what happens now is the, Im the immune defence of the upper respiratory tract is breached. And the bacteria from here run all the way down into the lungs how it's represented in uh, how, what it looks like in cattle and feed yards. This is viral challenge in both of these cattle here. It's represented like a serious discharge, sometimes with blood running from the nose. This one in particular would be IBR. That would be that herpes virus. This steer here is totally healthy and totally fine. He's just challenged with uh, viral, the, the, the viruses <coughs> of the respiratory disease complex. He's, you know, like this, he's putting on weight, he's in good health. He's been able to hold that uh, viral infection and that challenge just to his uh, upper respiratory tract here, specifically up to his nasal passages and sinuses. But some cattle let this uh, viral infection, they don't have the immunity to block that viral infection heading to lower, lower parts of their respiratory system. <coughs> IBR by itself, uh, the one that's caused the blood running out the nose, here's a nice clean windpipe. Here's one that's, a, that's been overwhelmed by IBR. That's what's called a sewer pipe trachea because it looks exactly like that. Down here on this close to the surface, that lining of the windpipe's actually been is dyed. It's, uh, it's, it's dead and it's sort of falling off. This can be fatal just by itself. Pestivirus, and I imagine a lot of, a lot of people in the room have sort of had some exposure to, uh, well, you haven't been exposed to pestivirus, maybe you have, but um, it's had an awareness of pestivirus um, and uh, its effects probably more around uh, reproduction, effects on, um, its effects on uh, conception. Uh, calf, uh, more, well, I guess, I guess um, uh, basically uh, late-term late -term abortions potentially, but the production of uh, PI calves. And uh, this is significant in feed yards, more so in American feed yards because uh, in, in America, the pestivirus over there is of two types, type 1 and type 2. In Australia, we only get type 1, the less, um, I guess, virulent uh, type of pestivirus. We did some work on this and we got two uh, identified persistently infected carriers of pestivirus here um, and we looked at the effect of them in feedlot pens. So while we got all that virus being passed around, we looked at the effect of having 
two persistently infected cattle in a, in a pen, and these, the, pen at this, the pens at this feedlot were 100 head. So two of them in 100 head, there's 2% of the whole pen were, were, PI, were PI cattle. And we had a look at what effect that had on overall morbidity. And it wasn't like it was in the States. If you put two of these in 100 head uh, in the States and they're type 2 pestivirus, you'll see some pretty, um, you'll, you'll see some pretty significant effects on, on overall sickness. In Australia, we didn't see that. We didn't see them really cause a lot more extra sickness in the pen. But this, these are the same two cattle, that closeout sort of thing, and these guys here, these three guys here, started actually 30 days after them. So we certainly still have the effect of, uh, of pestivirus like you know, causing sort of uh, lower production, like they don't, they don't gain as well. Uh, they sort of pretty much look the same at the end of the feeding period as it did when they came in. But um, as far as causing increased morbidity and sickness in, in feedlot pens, we just didn't see that. There's some things that we can measure and some things that are pretty useful to know to sort of predict what's coming with respiratory disease. And here's a, a feed yard in southern Australia that has sale yard and paddock purchases. And you can see through this whole period here, and this was significant BRD through this period here, uh, I, I, I vividly recall, the sale yard cattle died at about twice the rate of the paddock purchase cattle. The effect of weight on treatments, it sort of stands to reason, it's fairly intuitive. The, the lighter that the cattle are, the younger they are, the less their immunity generally. And so these, uh, these cattle were represented higher in the treatments overall. As far as mortality goes, it's the same thing. The lighter weight, the younger, the less immunity, the higher rate they died at, irrespective of where they were purchased. We looked at purchase lot size on paddock cattle. As you got down into small lot sizes here of only 10, 5 head, and the, and the particular feedlot that we were looking at this, that was the case. Some lot sizes, some purchase lot sizes were only 2 and 3 head, such that in a, in a typical feedlot pen we could, could be represented by 100 different sources. <laughs> Not 100, typically it was 50, that's still a lot. Whereas um, uh, the sundown operation, it's all having one vendor in one pen and it was, you get significant benefit from that. But when we get down into these small lot sizes here, the, the paddock cattle sort of behaved like sale yard cattle overall. There was too much mixing, too much um, sort of commingling in, in these feed yard, in these pens. And when it's uh, sale yard purchases, it didn't really matter what the lot sizes were. The, the effect of going through a sale yard caused enough stress by itself. And, and lowered the immune defence of cattle coming into the feed yards. This R squared number being up here about 0.76, nearly close to one, means we're, we're explaining a lot of the data. It's a, pretty good, it's a pretty good representation of what's going on. Just having a look at this real quick in the same feed yard, we, we have mortality rates here in the sale yard of up to 2.64%, sale yard source cattle, but paddock source cattle down about 1.19%. This feed yard had a lot of lightweight um, cattle that were sort of supplied into sort of trade markets and they, they started out light, they started out young, there was a mixture of sale, sale yard and paddock, so you saw sort of significant death loss in this yard, but even within that the sale yard purchased cattle had a higher rate of death loss. Uh, you'll note here that a uh, number of vendors, you know, like when we actually grabbed all the tail tags and all the picks and everything and had a look at this, the sale yard cattle represented this many sources through that period, whereas the paddock um, sources were only that much. Different profits, of course, that's the, that's the general outcome. They were making a profit through this period. I, I don't think that's the case now. <laughs> but, yeah, it was definitely the old days, yeah, that was 2004. It's a good <coughs> 10 years ago. Um, BRD diagnostics, if you bring your dog, your cat, your foal, your horse, whatever to the vet, we've got all this stuff that we can use, like blood tests and x-rays and then the like. Uh, in the feed yard, this is it. This is the first line of diagnosis. Pen riders going out into pens and finding these, these cattle that are crook and pulling them to the hospital for treatment. So these guys are, are pretty much, um, they're triage, the doctor, they're everything. They've got to go out there and diagnose this stuff in every, and it's happening right now as we speak across the feed yards across Australia. Like I said, in the, in the um, you bring a horse to the clinic, we've got all this stuff that we can use. We sort of cheat fairly hard. You know, endoscopes and uh, with uh, ultrasounds on the chest and rebreathing bags and stuff like that. You can even scale it up to, you know, this is a practice in Tamworth run by a very good veterinarian, Peter Best, I think, you know, this cat, cat scanning of dogs. Have a, have a, you know, if you've got a bit of a <laughs> chest yourself, yeah, this, this uh, obnoxious, <laughs> obnoxious little Jack Russell, so I think he was in for a, for a um, cat scan. There's a good $1,500 there just to find out what's wrong with him and then go on with it. <laughs> So uh, I know you hear the mirth in the room, so I think so 
Anyone own a Jack Russell? <laughs> so feedlot staff have got all this to do, like they've got to go out there and they don't have that range of diagnostics uh, um, available. They've got to be, have good skills at reading cattle behaviour, they've got to be very good at detecting abnormalities in body language, they've got to be able to pick that. And they've, got, and they've got to be able to, uh, if they're good acclimators, we can't get into acclimation right now, sort of thing, but it's a, it's a methodology of working with cattle so that you can actually pick these small variations up. And they've got to be able to pick differences because usually cattle getting sick, the, the, the best hope for getting a treatment success is picking this, these diseases early. Couple that with some good stock skills sort of thing, which is in de decreasing supply in the feed yards in the, over the last decade, then you can maximise your BOD detection and, and management. We've so basically when the guys go in into pens, they have to look at cattle and pick, pick whether they think that they're starting to get uh, crook with BRD. As you see in this picture here, this guy is just like, like uh, I guess if you look at it as a timeline, the different cattle, but here's early BRD, just starting to go off, just starting to sort of get depression signs. And that's what we get them to focus on is depression signs. Cattle are prey animals, they typically, you know, if it's a good day for them, they're, they're up, they're looking at the horizon, they're bright, alert, responsive, ears, head and everything is up. They're with the rest of the crew, so I think they've got purpose um, and uh, they're otherwise fit and healthy. As they start to get sick, things start to drop off for them. They start with depression and with all those bacteria rattling around their lungs and in their circulation, they will start to get depressed, they'll run a fever. And so the head will start to drop, the ears will start to drop, the eyelids will get heavy, the pole gets heavy. They start to lack purpose when they move around the pen. They start to want, as a prey animal, the first thing they want to do when they're first starting to get crook is they want to, just like, you know, buffalo on the Serengeti or otherwise, they don't want to reveal that sickness, so they, uh, they actually want to sort of hide from you in that. If you've uh, done some good acclimation work, this becomes a bit easier for you to actually pick these things before that, that happens, but first, uh, first defence of a prey animal is to sort of hide and not show his sickness. Here, we're starting to actually get obvious signs of sickness and here, this, this, this picture here is God's waiting room. That, this one isn't much longer for this world. So just, uh, just before I um, set, set this uh, video off, um, this is a sort of a training video that we have for, for new staff at feed yards. And uh, I apologise from the outset that the subject of this video is indeed a Hereford. And, uh, but the reason we chose this is because at this, in this yard, in this particular case, was amongst some um, black cattle so that it was easy enough for someone new who's very new at this, in the end you could just say, look, just watch the, watch the red one. So, um, <laughs> so uh, basically this is me up on a horse, I'm filming, these are the old days. Now what I've actually got is one of those little GoPro-y things that you can mount on your helmet, so it's great. But because most of the time when I'm doing this, I'm holding a camera in this hand and Stockman's report in this hand or something else, I think, and riding a horse. Um, and, and if anyone's seen me on a horse, you'll, need, you'll know I need both hands. Um, but in any case, what we're looking at is this little guy over here. So he's actually done a big, wet, chesty cough just over, um, over my left shoulder, and, uh, sorry, here. And um, so that's how I picked, picked him up. But you'll notice the behaviour of this, this, this deer. Is what he's trying to do at this point, this is about the third time he's tried to hide from me. As the rest of the mob moves, he will try to get sort of uh, in behind them and that. Now you can see the posture here, one of a heavy head, heavy ears, heavy eyelids. This is a classic manoeuvre here of a steer just starting to get to put this steer's head between him and me. He's just trying to hide from me, he's just trying to sort of um, you know, conceal what's going on. As this goes on for much longer and I start to move the, the, pen, the pen out a little bit, you'll see that he takes on the classic posture of pretty advanced BRD and that's with uh, the head really low um, and what I ask new pen riders or new staff to do is once they're, once they're looking at this steer and they're trying to get all those clinical signs in their head and get that checklist of things they need to be looking at is just to compare to the other cattle around them. These guys are bright, alert, responsive. Heads and ears and everything's up and that is the classic posture, oh, that is the classic posture right there, it goes on. Um, uh, of, of BRD with his head down and everything sort of um, uh, depressed and heavy and, um, and all the other cattle around look markedly different. Now that's a pretty advanced case, we want our pen riders to pick that up a lot earlier than that. Um, that. That steer there could have done with being detected two days earlier. When we miss cattle, when we miss those signs and they go on to die, or alternatively if we pull them and they're dead within 48 hours, it means we've been a bit late on them, we've missed them. When, when we looked at our whole database, that's across trade cattle, bullocks, all companies that we deal with, 
uh, and all the companies that Matt uh, George deals with as well, put them all into one big database. We had a, these are the, the, the mispulled data are cattle that have died within three days of being pulled, or they've just found them dead in the pen. These are the days on feed that that happens. So you can define a really big risk period here between pretty much 10 to 35 days. That's if you just left everything alone, you didn't do anything about it, you just let cattle die in the feedlot. They would of BRD. They would typically die in that range there, 10 to 35 days. We look at it in bullocks. It's you know that pretty much is, is represented there with uh, trade cattle, 70 day stuff. It starts a little bit earlier and it finishes a little bit earlier. But if you wanted to use a broad brush stroke, 10 to 35 days is when you'll see most of your BRD. So we, we tool our pen riders up to know what signs they are, but when they ride into a pen that's 15, 20 days, 25 days on feed, they have to really switch on. It's, it's grand final time. They really need to switch on and make sure they don't miss these cattle. Um, first quarter this year, so then it's, uh, when we look at our, our whole database, you can see that that is the case, sort of between 15 here and 30 days. That's all cattle, all companies, all feedlots. Um, when we look at it uh, this, this uh, second quarter up to the 30th of June, it's just maintaining that shape. And you can see it really kicks up here between 10 and 30 days. Sure, cattle die out here as well, but if we want to teach new pen riders to just two simple things, and that's all the clinical signs of BRD, but really switch on when you get into pens of these days on feed. Um, looking at morbidity, that's first quarter. This, the second quarter just happened through this April effect. You can see that the cumulative morbidity rises. Autumn is a higher challenge period of BRD across all feed yards. There's weather factors and, and cattle sourcing factors and that that we can get into, but, but typically you, uh, autumn is when you see more BRD. And if you look at a timeline of that, so that's 2010, 2012, you know, um, kicked up a little bit earlier, February, March there, but through February, March, April, May, you see all the treatments go up there again. Have a lull through the winter sort of thing as things um, cool down and stabilise a bit. When cattle get pulled to the feed yard, uh, pulled to the hospital, if their temperature increases, that's the temperature that we take when they first come to the hospital to be treated, the higher the, re the rectal temperature they have on presentation, the more chance of, of, of being pulled and the more chance of, sorry, the more chance of dying, sorry, that, that represents there, that's a percentage of pulls, the higher the chance of dying. So we've got a couple of things that we can use once the cattle are at the, um, at the hospital to sort of confirm that diagnosis, but we still need pen riders to be out there to know what they're looking for. We've got some groovy things that we've sort of been mucking around with. This is an electronic stethoscope, so we put it on the chest of cattle when they come into the hospital um, and uh, sort of confirm diagnosis. This uh, steer here is a honker. This is what potentially got some IBR rattling around in his uh, windpipe, and, he, and he's uh, making like a necrotic laryngitis type sort of um, uh, breath sound. Pretty intense um, traces here. A BRD pool that's sort of less than, um, the, the BRD pool that's 40.7, uh, degrees, he's pretty high risk of, of being quite crook here. This is the sort of trace that he's got. So this is a confirmation of diagnosis tool, but we try to use it as a training tool. So, think, so we show those guys those videos, we show them what days on feed they should be looking at cattle, use some confirmation stuff to just sort of say, yep, you got this one right, or that one, you know, we need to sort of look a little bit harder. This, this isn't a totally, um, you know, this is a little bit infallible, so think. we've still got a little bit more work to do with this stuff, but some of this technology is starting to creep in. Uh, when you use lung scores, you know, like the, the, some work done in the US looking at um, the actual lung score, so the higher the lung score, the more significant it was on the stethoscope when they were presented, the more chance they had uh, lung scores in the, in the abattoir. And uh, I'll just go through that. Um, uh, when cattle come to the hospital, we want these guys to have a good organised system and, and good sort of husbandry of these guys. That's much lower density than they were in the home pen, for instance. They just need to really look after this cattle, not just give them antibiotics, they actually need to sort of, you know, have, provide good husbandry as well. And um, as far as the antibiotics go, this is just a little bit of fun, this one. Uh, Alenco supplied some data <coughs> in the States during the 90s and up to 2005 on the production of, on the manufacture of new antibiotics. You can see in that first chart that BRD just kept going up and up and up and up, that we've actually had more and more death loss due to BRD over time. And in, the, in that time, these are all the new antibiotics that have been um, manufactured in that time. So there's a lot of new antibiotics in a short space of time. And pretty much during that time, like we said, we've seen BRD death loss still just rise at this rate here. So the Elenco guys had a look at this and they had a little, little bit of fun. They said, well, look, if that's increasing at 0.2% every 10 years, that would mean by that rationale and using that sort of equation extrapolated out, 
That means by the year 6990, all the cattle are dead. If we keep going on like this, it's going to, that's, that's, what, that's, what's looking, that's what we've got to look forward to, that everything's going to be dead by then. So it's a little bit of fun, I think, but what it's trying to say is that no matter how much we develop new uh, antibiotics and new vaccines and all, and, and all of that, we still have this issue that we're sort of uh, against the rising tide, that BRD is just increasing over time. We've also got this issue. We're using antibiotics. Um, you know, there's uh, ethical concerns amongst consumers. Uh, ethical concerns, but also they, they're sort of being a little bit more scrutinising of where their food comes from and how, it's, and how that food's produced. We try to do things like try to mitigate the risk of BRD at the point of induction. This is that IBR virus, a vaccine against that IBR virus, Rhinogard, some new vaccines looking at some of the bacterial components of BRD, trying to vaccinate against that. Um, by far and away the most successful use of vaccines for cattle uh, in feed yards to reduce their health risk is before feedlot entry. And um, uh, Matthew Monk's group and Sundown are, are pretty much championed some great um, management around this that are sort of uh, industry leading in how to utilise these vaccines and how to utilise a sort of a, ca a preparation program, be it weaning, be it backgrounding or integrating the whole lot together to try to reduce the risk of BRD when these cattle come into the feed, into the feed yard. A lot of our vaccines require this as an amnestic response. You, mo all of these vaccines here require two shots and you really only get a response to the vac after the second shot, a significant uh, immune response after the second shot. No matter where the cattle come from, no matter what breed they are, no matter what feed yard they go into, a study looking at this looked at the effects of increasing feeder guard at the time was a, was a program to um, uh, supply these vaccines uh, pre-feedlot, pre but the, the, whether it was feeder guard or whether it was under the vaccination program, you would see that morbidity would reduce as the increasing amount of cattle vaccinated within a lot or a pen. As, as that increased, the morbidity actually reduced in the pen. And the same for mortality as well. As you increase the amount of vaccinated cattle in the pen, the mortality would drop precipitously. The other thing that was interesting about this was here's the, con uh, here's the feeder guard cattle here, the ones that are actually vaccinated, and here's the cattle, other cattle in the pen that weren't vaccinated but benefited from having vaccinated cattle in the pen. Their mortality dropped too. Once they were vaccinated, they weren't shedding as much virus. They had good immune systems sort of thing, so that they could actually handle the challenge and not shed as much virus to their pen mates. Uh, when we, one of the feed yards that I uh, work with, sort of thing, they do their own backgrounding on farm, having a look at some of the uh, non-backgrounded cattle that are Woolies cattle going into the feed yard. They're running at mortalities here of 0.47% and morbidities of up to 18%. But the stuff that they background on farm using either vaccination protocol, much lower morbidities, mortalities, much lower morbidities. Uh, this was a, a risk assessment calculator that we developed back in 2005. <coughs> Things have changed a little bit from here, but we, we sort of wanted to know what was coming for us. I think. So we, what, we broke this up into Sayo, paddock source, backgrounded, where they came from, what regions, entry weights, stuff like that. I must admit at the time, Keep knocking that over, sorry. At the time, uh, but it sort of holds true. We rated Herefords as a high risk. So then we gave them a higher risk rating than we did the Bostaurus uh, mixed cattle and Bosinigus down here. I must, if I be truthful, I'll be honest, sort of thing, that this is still, this is probably still reasonable to rate uh, Herefords as a breed higher up in the risk for, um, uh, going into feed yards, and we'll talk about that in a second. But using this risk rating, we sort of knew whether we were going to sort of make small pens out of these cattle or whether we're actually going to line these up for metaphylactic programs such as mass treats and stuff and, and, and the like during the um, autumn period in particular. One of our feed, it's very difficult to get breed data and something I'm going to talk about right at the end, it's not too far away, is uh, how we can sort of look at this issue so then going forward thing and it's very difficult and it took a fair bit just in one feed yard to get all of this data for, based on breed, this was again back in 2005, you could see that Herefords as a breed were represented higher in the death loss. Now the limos and the limo crosses here, to be fair to them, there was only a small population. There was a very small population went into this feed yard during this period, so I think. So um, the, uh, if you take that out of the equation, the Herefords were represented higher in the death loss in this feed yard at that time. And that feed yard just, uh, suffered from things like in the US data here showing, you know, like by far and away the highest proportion of cattle were small lot sizes. These are, these are the beef operations in the US in 2010 
one to 50 head is by far the biggest proportion of all cattle being supplied into, into feed yards. These bigger 500 plus head operations are very are, are, the, are the smaller proportion of all producers. Having a look at this, having have a look at what can we do about this, we know BRD is rising over time, we've got a couple of things that we can do, but just having a look at, well, well what else is there? What bigger, large sort of um, scale things can we do? The uh, MLA had a look at the National BRD Initiative, trying to get all the information from producers all the way through the, the, the chain to the abattoir about, you know, what are the factors, what are the epidemiological factors to, to do with BRD? That project has run, and I can tell you that they, they didn't want me to put a slide up there, but um, Herefords were again represented higher in the death loss, in, and so that project was actually done um, uh, at, at a sort of a, a like a survey level and over, run over about three years, I think. So they manually grabbed all this data out, and I'm afraid that Herefords were represented higher in the death loss again in, in that study. And and so I guess what it lends itself to is saying, well, look, why why is that? Why why are Herefords represented higher in in these? in these death loss. Um, this project here is very ambitious and, uh, and, and um, Andrew um, is going to talk to you later from, from Armadale about some, some genetic stuff and it's a, it's a fascinating talk and, and, um, and I was talking to him just a minute ago about what's, what's the likelihood of these sort of projects teasing some, some stuff out to sort of tell us what, where, these, where in the chromosome, where in the genome is this, all this happening, where is this sort of lack of resistance to disease and, and whilst these guys have got a fairly ambitious program um, happening, the problem is, in, in order to do this, so, so these guys are sort of saying year in, year out, yeah, we've got a lot of respiratory disease, it's a, you know, we've got new vaccines, we've got new antibiotics, all sort of stuff, we don't seem to be doing much about it, we need to develop new approaches, and they're right. The long-term goal is to reduce the incidence of BRD in beef and dairy cattle by sort of capitalising on genomics, and, and it's really, you know, it, it's, it's applaudable sort of stuff. The problem is, this is the way to do it, um, is having uh, and, and there's going to be a lot of money spent on this, so the, these guys in California have a training herd where they're actually measuring the genetic variation within those cattle. And what the training herd is, I guess, is representative of the greater cattle population. And um, so doing a lot of sort of DNA testing, a lot of SMP, single nucleotide poly... Yeah, SMPs. Uh, <laughs> genotypic stuff to actually um, measure what's going on in that training herd and try to relate it to the greater population. The issue is, and, and uh, Andrew sort of uh, put it very well, if that training herd doesn't represent the greater herd out there, then you lose accuracy. And, and trying to pin down in, the, in, the, in a single allele or a single chromosome or, or part or section of the, of the DNA where this uh, propensity to have less resistance to BRD is, uh, is going to take a lot of work, a, a, a lot of work. And, and, it's, and you know, once, once you start to lose accuracy, you start to lose the, the point of the whole thing. So this, this is great, and, and I, I really, you know, it's great that the Americans are out there doing this, but I would call this a very long-term solution. We're not going to have this tomorrow. Um, if they come up with a prediction equation um, and uh, that it's actually got a lot of accuracy, well, that'll be great. We'll be able to actually DNA test cattle and, and know whether they're going to be susceptible to BRD or not. Um, a lot of this stuff's going on. A lot of people are out there sort of measuring these sort of genomic based, so sort of um, genetic based sort of um, characteristics of BRD and trying to pin down some, um, some, I guess, some correlations and that. Got to admit, in the short term, there are things that are probably going to be more useful. Now, this is a feed yard that I service. This is the big 47,000, 50,000 head feed yard. And there are Herefords that go there all the time, fairly consistently, and do very well. In this in this uh, example, it's the Mount Riddick Hereford sort of thing, but there are other places as well. There are other stations that supply cattle that do very well. They don't, um, they don't have the same amount of morbidity and sickness and, and, and disease and death loss that we see in some other yards or, or some other suppliers. Um, and in the short to medium term, the options are more likely looking at some of these pre-feedlot factors. So the things that I'm interested in in particular is we looked at all of that data about uh, the live weight going in, the number of uh, vendors in the pen and all that sort of stuff, the sale yard sourcing and that. What I'm interested in is where are Herefords in all of that? How much are they represented in sale yard transactions? How much are they represented in small lot size? How much are they represented in um, sort of uh, in the live weight that they go into? You know, now EU lots are you know, typically heavier sort of thing, but is that always the case? Are Herefords in a lot of trade markets and stuff like that? That's the sort of, it's a, there's a real data solution to this, and that's finding out whether um, Herefords are represented in all of those higher risk um, sort of factors that we know that are, are sort of represented higher in BRD. And I went 
went to have a look at this to see how we could do it. And uh, first of all, started with the Breed Society and John and just said, oh, we're sure that we can get this data. And it's not that easy. It's not that, not that easy at all. Probably the way to do it will be at the feed yard level. We, we need to, uh, for them to collect data on, uh, they already collect data on sale yard and paddock purchases. That already happens to some extent. But what we want them to do is to actually start, and what they don't do, they, they, they certainly record what market type or what cattle type that these um, cattle are going into, but some of their market types can be represented by a variety of breeds. What we need them to do is actually collect data on breed at feedlot entry. So collect that data, collect the data, and then there's other stuff they already do, which is live weight and all that sort of stuff, but we need to build a database, I think, at the feedlot level. And we need to see whether these guys are actually, uh, if we see here if it's end up in multi-mixed pens, whether we see them mostly through sale yard transactions. What, what, when do we see them all placed through the autumn? Or are they sort of placed at the same rate year in, uh, month in, month out? That sort of stuff is the initial things that we need to do. What's the rate of uh, pre-vaccination? How many of them come through MAT system, for instance, which is a very good system to sort of to get them ready for feed, feedlot entry, uh, sorry, to get them ready for feedlot production so that they don't get crook. How much of that happens? And Matt's going to talk a little bit about that in a second too. So, so some of this sort of pre-feedlot stuff is, I think, is our short-term goal to try to have Herefords more attractive to the, to the feedlot industry and, in, and try to actually get away from some of those things that might be dragging them down. I don't know <coughs> where they sit in all of those factors and that, but it's, <coughs> that's the sort of data that we need. So I'm done. This is um, Pine Grove the other day up in Steve's territory sort of thing. So, these guys are pretty happy. We need to have more of this. Thank you.